Good day, folks. This message uh, is the one that I delivered to our congregation in church on Sunday. Uh, I had some technical difficulties uh, on Sunday and wasn't able to get those fixed until today. I did uh, stream this live this morning, and then I found out that I didn't have any audio, so I deleted that uh, that stream. And we're this is third time a charm, they call it. So the the message this morning. Uh, of course, we'll follow here in a moment, but let's just uh, let me introduce some scriptures to you. It's Isaiah chapter 9. I'm reading verses 9 and 10. The prophet writes to us, he says, The Lord has sent a message against Jacob. It will fall upon Israel. All the people will know it. Ephraim and the inhabitants of Samaria who say with pride and arrogance of heart, The bricks have fallen down, but we will rebuild with dressed stone." The fig trees have been fallen, but we will replace them with cedars. And from the New Testament, I'm reading from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24, verses 36 to 44. Jesus writes or says to us, About that day or hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and given in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how the coming of the Son of Man will be. Two people will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two people will be grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken and the other left. Therefore, keep watch, because if the owner of the house had known by what time of night the thief was coming, he would have not, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready because the son of man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Let's uh, go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and for your teaching uh, us through the scriptures. And we just pray, Lord, that uh, through your spirit, that the message uh, for today, Lord, will be written upon our hearts in this I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I had been working on a sermon uh, to deliver on Sunday, and when it came down to getting uh, the sermon on paper for a manuscript to use, I sensed that it was the wrong message for Sunday. And that happens from time to time, sometimes as late as Sunday morning. So I put that planned sermon aside, and on Friday, September 11th, this sermon was laid upon my heart. In this message, you're going to get a little bit of history, of course, to help make some sense of it all. And I'm going to be probably offending or saying things that people won't like or believe. Uh, For some, that may not be anything new. On top of that, I'm likely to offend everyone because I believe that each of us as believers can be closer to God. But most choose not to. And the question is why? The reasons vary, but when you get to the heart of the matter, God wants us closer. He doesn't want us ignoring him. And it's in our ignoring God that we stray away from him. We, in our own human strength, seem to be able to get along uh, in life pretty well for the most part. But there lies the problem. We live in our own strength. We live as as we see fit. And we often don't consult God or his word to see where he weighs in on our lives. And this is nothing new and, I believe, the root of the world's problems. As Christians, we know this, but we keep on in our daily lives as if we're asleep. Let me share some history first from the Old Testament concerning the reading that I shared from Isaiah chapter 9. You can read the Old Testament books of 1st and 2nd Kings to get more details of what was happening in the prophetic book of Isaiah. He was a prophet uh, that was uh, speaking uh, on behalf of God to the, the nation of Israel in the time of the kings. We get more details of what's happening, and in these verses in Isaiah 9, the prophet was revealing Israel's heart as it con- was concerning God. And it mentions Jacob. Well, Jacob is Israel. The message was for Israel. And at that time, the, the entire nation of Israel had been split into two. There was a southern kingdom, and that consisted of the tribes of Judah and Benjamin, And then there was the northern kingdom. That was the other ten tribes. Both the north and the southern kingdoms at this point in time were in spiritual trouble. The kings were falling away from God and allowing pagan worship of other foreign gods. 
the southern kingdom did have a revival for a while, and it, it turned around for a time. At the time that Isaiah wrote this, the northern kingdom was under the leadership of King Ahab, and he had a pagan wife named Jezebel. And they led Israel into the worship of Baal, a, a pagan god who required child sacrifice and all sorts of things that were detestable to God. So God raised up an enemy of Israel to give them a warning of sorts, the kingdom of Assyria. They were raised up to power, and they attacked portions of the northern kingdom of Israel. They were breaking down the walls, and they caused, you know, a fair bit of damage, but nothing seriously or too major. They cut down the fig trees that were good for food, and you could call this maybe a warning shot, if you like. This was a defining moment for Israel. They had a choice to make. They could return to God and repent of their evil ways, and if they did that, then God would have spared them the demise that was coming. This attack mentioned in Isaiah 9 was just a minor warning, as I mentioned. But what did the northern kingdom do with this warning? Verse 10 sums it up. They admit, they say the bricks have fallen down, but we will rebuild with dressed stone. The fig trees have been fallen, but we will replace them with cedars. In other words, they were ignoring God's warning and said, we've got this. We'll just rebuild bigger and better. Instead of using these little mud bricks that we use to make our wall, we'll get these large hewn stone cut from the mountains. They won't break. And as far as the trees go, we'll replace them with more sturdy trees like cedars. Replace those sycamore fig trees. If we fast forward in history from Isaiah's warning to Israel and their ignoring God's will, later on in the following decades, God had raised up this, this new kingdom, this new powerful enemy of Israel, Assyria. And they took the northern tribes into captivity, basically eliminating them as a nation. It was a tough judgment that was placed on them, but they had been warned. This was the northern kingdom. As I mentioned before, the southern kingdom of Judah uh, and ben uh, Benjamin, well, they had a revival for a while, but later on they fell to the same fate. This time it was the empire of the Babylonians. The nation of Israel, like it was back in King David's time, would never see the likes again never see the power, never see them being uh, focusing on God. And they would always be oppressed by others throughout the past 2,500 years. So where am I going with all of this history? Well, most of us have heard of the saying that history repeats itself. And I believe in part that this can be true. A hundred or so years ago, Britain was the world power. They sought to create a place for the Jewish people. Uh, on your old atlases and stuff, it would show where Israel is now that it was called Palestine. But the British got control of all of that land, and they were etching out some land for Israel. And it was just on paper, mind you. God had raised up the British Empire because they favored the Jews. And in the early 1900s, the British changed the land area that Israel was going to get, and the deal fell, falls through. Really, from then on, the British Empire began to shrink, and it began to fall. And another nation was raised up to be the superpower of the world. And that nation was the United States of America. The United States was favorable to the Jewish people. The Arabs, even to this day, they refer to the nation of Israel as little Satan uh, or little Israel. And they refer the United States as great Satan or great Israel. Because for a time, there was more Jews living in the United States than there was in their own homeland in the Middle East. So stay with me. Switching gears here to, uh, for a bit to mention a book that I read earlier this year called The Harbinger. The word harbinger can be defined as a warning. The author of the book is Jonathan Kahn. Google his name and investigate him a little bit. I read his book and a few other books that he had wrote this past spring, but put it mildly, I was amazed at what this man had to say. I believe, I feel that he's a modern day prophet. I quote from the internet search regarding Khan. It says, Jonathan Kahn is a messianic Jewish pastor whose novel, The Harbinger, compares the United States and the September 11th attacks to ancient Israel and the destruction of the kingdom of Israel. Kahn, in his book, he compares Israel's defiance towards God some 2,500 years ago with the same types of actions displayed by the United States towards God since the warning from God via the 9-11 attacks. Now here, some folks may be listening. They will be offended at the fact that I say that God allowed those attacks on the United States. 
and I hear you, but you can't ignore the facts. 19 years ago on Friday, we all can relate, uh, likely recall what happened in New York, Washington, and Pennsylvania. A bunch of interesting things was going on regarding the attacks on New York and its response. Khan, in his book, shows multiple aspects of what Israel did and said regarding the Isaiah reading I shared earlier, similar to what the United States did in the aftermath of 9-11. The moral decay of the country, the falling away from God by the United States, a nation that God had raised up and blessed like no other nation. The defiance that they show by not turning back to God, but instead saying, we'll rebuild. We'll rebuild bigger and stronger. We'll get the enemies. Politicians even quoting Isaiah 9, verses 9 and 10, which showed Israel's defiance towards God, and thus it echoed the same defiance towards God like Israel had done. It seems like history had been repeating itself. Now, I can't go into the details of the book. This, this, it would take too long. But if you Google the book, The Harbinger, there's a number of interviews on uh, YouTube that you can watch, and you get a rough outline of what Jonathan Kahn, what I believe, what he was given by God to share with us. 9-11 certainly was horrific. I watched uh, the North Tower on fire, not knowing what had happened. And then I witnessed the second plane hit the South Tower live on TV. And I stated out loud then that our world will never be the same. Never be the same. 2,996 people perished that day due to hatred. And it appears to me that God was allowing this hatred to be a warning to the United States. And sadly, the nation hasn't repented. It hasn't turned back to God, to the God which the country was founded upon. The United States, when it was established, was founded by its leaders in a church. And it wasn't in Washington, DC. This little church is on the same acreage site as a Twin Tower site. It wasn't in Washington. If the warning that Israel received was ignored, and we can see from history what happened, to Israel, will the same sort of judgment fall upon the United States? This isn't conspiracy stuff. These are the facts from history and our present day troubles too. I believe that because the world has not returned to God that one could easily think or, or say that COVID, COVID-19 could be another harbinger of sorts. And I've been saying for years that one day something's going to happen to bring the world to its knees. And I expected like many others, that it may come in the form of a war, maybe starting in the Middle East. And that's still possible. But who could have seen COVID-19 as something that would bring the world to a screeching halt? As we move further into the crisis earlier this year and seeing that it appears that it's not killing tens of millions of people right away, those of humanity who may have found themselves on their knees turning to God, many are standing up and defiant. We've got this. A vaccine will help us through this and get us back to life where uh, life was before COVID. Much of society is not looking to God for help, looking to turn back to God. That's not on the table. And this is why I fear that we're going to face more problems in the near future. I believe that COVID has been a warning and that our memory or thoughts of, of turning back to God as a nation, as a society, these warnings have quickly fled our minds. They've fallen off our hearts and minds. I've also been saying for years that I believe that we are living in the end times. And by that, I mean the return of Jesus Christ is closer than we may realize. I know faithful Christians have been saying this for close to 2,000 years, but never before has the world been in such a state as it is now. Many things have come into reality and biblical prophecy to set the stage for Jesus' return. It is true. No one really knows when Jesus shall return. The reading from uh, Matthew's gospel earlier stated that Jesus, Jesus says no one knows the day or the hour. But Jesus does give us, he gives us hints, gives us the things to look for so that we know that the time is near. If you read the entire chapter, Matthew 24, maybe do that after uh, the live stream, read what Jesus was saying prior to the verses that I shared. In the verses that I shared earlier, Jesus says the world will be in a state just like it was in the days of Noah before the flood. In verses 38 and 39, he says, in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage up to the day that Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came 
and took them away. Jesus will return at a time when we really don't expect it, meaning our world will continue to be defiant towards God. In the story of the flood, you can read that in Genesis 6, how humanity had become so evil that it grieved God and his heart was full of pain. The widespread evil in our world could be considered like it was in the days of Noah. With much of the world not paying much attention to seeking God in his ways, rather than seeking to please ourselves however we can, with no regard to the facts that it may be wrong or evil in God's eyes. And just prior to the flood, Jesus says the people were eating and drinking and kind of going on with their lives up until the day Noah entered the ark. Well, of course, they were going on with their lives. That's what we have to do as people. We need to eat and drink. But what Jesus was getting at, people were oblivious to the fact that judgment was coming. There were signs. Yes, there was a crazy man building a boat in the middle of the desert. In our day and age, maybe it might be a Jewish man living in the northeastern United States writing Christian prophecy, telling about how he fears judgment is coming to the United States if the nation doesn't turn back to God. Let me remind you here that it's not just the United States that's facing judgment. Our nation in Canada will not be exempt. Many nations in the world are feeling judgments already. You or I who live to serve God, we too might be considered crazy like Noah for our claiming that Christ may return soon, may have us looking a little less than the smartest card in the book. You and I as individuals, as a community, or us as a nation, we're all at a defining moment. The Lord could return at any time. Jesus tells us to be ready. He gives the analogy of being prepared and on guard to prevent our homes from being burglarized. He says, keep watch because you don't know what day the Lord will come. He says, if the owner of the house had known at what time the robber was going to come, he would have kept watch so his house wouldn't have been broken into. So he says, you must also be ready because the Son of Man may come at an hour when you don't expect him. We need to be ready for Jesus' return. And you might say, well, Mark, I interpret the Bible differently than you, and I don't see Jesus coming for a while yet. This has to happen or that has to happen. That's fine. Some could think like this for sure. But if you're the person who doesn't believe in Jesus and you happen to die before Jesus returns, you're in eternal trouble. If I didn't believe in Jesus and I die, then I end up being wrong about Jesus. Well, then it's too late for me to accept Jesus. I'll suffer eternal punishment. And that comment might, uh, might offend some of you, as some of you don't believe in hell. But Jesus sure did. He speaks of hell quite a bit. We're all at a defining moment. As Christians, will we continue to live so-so lives for Christ? Or will we seek him in deeper and more meaningful ways? For those of you that might be listening to haven't accepted Jesus as God, you too are at a defining moment. Will you take this moment to accept Jesus, accept his holy sacrifice for your mistakes, or will you be defiant and not even recognize your need for forgiveness? You may die before Jesus returns. So are you going to die while still defying God? Are you still going to be living in defiance of God until Jesus returns? Jesus tells us to be ready, to be on guard, that he may come at an hour when we least expect it. While we live our lives, eating, drinking, doing the stuff of life, but all the while ignoring God, not good. Just like all those who said to Noah, you are a crazy man, you know, building a boat in the middle of the desert. They all perished. For those of us who are believers, pray that God will help us live more for him. And for those of you who don't believe that Jesus died for your sins, I pray that you'll open your ears. And listen close, listen hard, because time is running out. Don't put off seeking forgiveness from God through Jesus. You have absolutely nothing to lose. You will have to set your pride aside. Humble yourself before God and pray, Lord, forgive me, for I'm a sinner. Pray to God to, that help me. Pray to help me, God, in whatever shape that you find me in, Lord. Help me to hear the truth to see the circumstances that I will face in eternity. Help me, Lord, to be ready for when you call me home. These are things that we need to be thinking about. 
God has been giving us warnings. All sorts of things that he's allowing to happen so that we may figure it out that we need the one true living God. God doesn't want us to be lost. He wants us to come to him for forgiveness, for life, for blessings, not distress. He allows warnings. We can see it in history. He's once again giving us warnings that he's about to show the world that he is the one true living God. And he's about to send his son to gather believers. So we're all in a defining moment. Will we turn to God for life and forgiveness? Or will we be like Israel some 2,500 years ago and defy God and think that we can figure this all out on our own? That we can do it without God? I don't want to sound like a doomsday person, but as I understand scriptures, our turning away from God hasn't pleased God at all. He judged the world once before in the days of Noah, and God is about to allow judgments once again. These initial judgments are to wake us up. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Humble yourself before the creator and savior. Seek to hear what God is truly saying. Stop this craziness in our lives because he's telling us that he loves us. He says that he's love you, that he loves you, and that these are warnings for you and I. We cannot win eternal life on our own. It's your defining moment, and it's my defining moment. What we do in the minutes that we have left will determine where we spend eternity in. And what we do in the moments we have left, be it a minute, a month, a year, whatever it is, whatever we do as believers may affect the eternal destination of the loved ones around us who haven't found Christ yet. So don't brush off these loving warnings from God. Because he's trying to get our attention. And he's praying, or I'm praying, that we choose wisely in these defining moments before us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, our world is filled with chaos. It's filled with heartache and pain. And it almost seems like how things, how could things get any worse? Lord, we know in our hearts as believers, we know that you have created the earth and we know you supplied us with Jesus Christ, that we may be reconciled to you. So help each one of us who, who believe in you, Lord, to be sure to share the gospel, to be ready for, for your uh, return. And help us, Lord, to help others to be ready, that we may see the warnings and to know that the time is near. Even if we don't know when Jesus returns, Lord, we may, we may perish at any moment. We know that life can be like this. So help us, Lord. Help us to be ready. Lord, I pray for all the concerns that are upon our hearts, those uh, with family members who are ill, those who are in long-term care. We pray, Lord, for the lifting of their spirits, the, the tragedies that are going on around in our world, uh, and the fires out west and hurricanes in the south and so many people suffering around the world from war-torn places. Lord, we need your return to bring peace. So we pray, Lord, that all of our cares, that we cast them upon you, that we count on you for help and for guidance. Help us to know that we are but mortals, that we cannot fix everything on our own, that you can help us through. We make this prayer in the name of Jesus, who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Heavenly Father, I pray a blessing upon all those who, uh, who watch the message, Lord, and take it in. I just pray, Lord, that uh, you bless us and protect us and our families and uh, lead us, guide us, Lord, in ways that are truly pleasing to you. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Blessings upon your week. Sorry for the delay. And don't forget to wash your hands. God bless.